Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the How to Get a Job at Gayaki Red Bull and Starbucks Q&A panel. My name is DJ Gray and I'm an Adobe Student Ambassador for the University of Utah and thank you guys for joining us if you're getting off work, if you're joining us after school, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm sure we're all very familiar with these companies. The majority of us are all college students and <laughs> caffeine aficionados. So, um, but we have three awesome representatives of their companies. I'm going to introduce them right now. We have Charles Morrison. He's the senior talent acquisition manager for records, marketing, and media at Red Bull. We have Madison Gallano Olson. Uh, she's over digital media. She's a digital media manager at Gayaki. And last but not least, we have Isaiah Lewis, and he's a product manager at Starbucks. We're going to get jumped right into our Q&A and make sure to stick around afterwards. We're going to be talking a little bit about Adobe Portfolio and an opportunity for you guys uh, to be selected to get a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of the panelists in Adobe a Creative Cloud for the year. So let's just hop right into it. I'm going to have you guys introduce yourselves, if that's okay. And Charles, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, like previously mentioned, I oversee the talent acquisition recruiting side of things for Red Bull Records and then marketing and media roles across the U.S. So super excited to be a part of this. I was also a college rep back in the day for Microsoft and Monster. And then uh, two years ago, helped oversee our uh, merging programs, interns, grads, etc. So super excited to be able to talk to everybody. Perfect. Thank you so much, Charles. Madison, I'll have you go next. Hi, everyone. I'm Madison Galliano Olson, and I am based in San Diego. I've been with Guayaki for five years and started doing their social media and now oversee all of our digital media and content creation. Thank you so much, Madison. And Isaiah. Hey, everybody. I'm Isaiah Lewis. I am a seven-year Starbucks partner currently based out of Seattle, Washington. I started as a barista while I was finishing up school at Arizona State, and I've worked in roles across supply chain and product management, currently supporting the uh, beverage business. Okay, well, perfect. Thank you guys so much once again uh, for coming and hanging out with us. We really appreciate it, um, myself as well. But let's get right into the question and answer portion of our panel. And I'll, Charles, I'll start with you. Uh, so get ready. <laughs> You've been a recruiter for quite a while now. What's a different, unique, what's new, different, unique to the talent pipeline and university recruiting business? Uh, I think it's a great question. I think overall, uh, a lot of it is going to what I've seen. A, what I've seen help drive success has been individuals that do their research, they find individuals, whether it's anybody on this panel today or anybody at the company they wanna work for, they reach out. Um, it's hard for a lot of these companies, you see Starbucks or Monte, Red Bull, a lot of these companies get hundreds if not thousands of applications. And so you wanna do whatever it takes to try and be competitive, try to reach out, try to attend events, try to be a part of whatever that scene is, speak to if Starbucks comes out with a new flavor, Red Bull comes out with a new flavor, any of these companies, right? Being able to have those conversations versus I'm just trying to get an internship or I'm just trying to get a job because that's what I want to do. So I think uh, really applying you know, yourself into your network, trying to meet new people and have those conversations, it goes a long way. Absolutely. And I'm sure you're skilled enough now that when you can, you can just tell when someone's being a little bit more authentic in terms of wanting to work for you and someone who's not. So thank you for your answer. Sure. Madison, I'll go with you next. Can you tell us a little bit about your career journey and what are some key things that you did that got you into the position that you are today? Awesome. Yeah. Where to start? Um, I started working young. My dad had his own business, a water skin wakeboard shop. My godmother had a boutique and then, you know, helping out at those shops when I was like 12, 13, 14. And at 14, through my high school surf team, I met the founder of Surfline, which is the leading media publication for surf digital media. Got a job there and just did everything I could for 10 years throughout high school, college, you know, mail, event planning, surf forecasting, anything I could do. I just wanted to do it while still getting really good grades in school and going to college. So 
to me, like any experience you can get inside the workforce as well as outside, um, especially branching outside of your bubble, your friends and family are great, but you have to meet other people to get more well versed on all walks of life. So that combination of work and school just really set me on the trajectory to kind of do what I do today, which is many hats in digital media and able to evolve and adapt easily. So I'd recommend people just really try any jobs they can until they find what they're really passionate about. Awesome. Thank you so much. Isaiah, you're next. Uh, you went to Arizona State University and you got a bachelor's in supply chain management, right? Yep, that's correct. Can you tell us a little bit about your story post-graduation? Yeah. Um, so to get to the post-graduation, I have to get some insight into the, the pre-graduation. Please I do. A, I was a supply chain major. I jumped around a lot. I had four different majors while I was at school, but finally landed on supply chain. And like I mentioned, I was a barista at Starbucks and uh, knew that Starbucks had one of the highest ranked supply chains across the really the US. So I was like, okay, that would be a great place to end up to really gain experience in that field. So I applied for an internship. First year, I actually didn't get it. Uh, and that was, it was tough, but it was also really a motivation factor. I think to just what Charles said, like, that motivated me to go back and really understand, well, what is it about Starbucks supply chain that I want to do? Why is it that I want to be a part of that? What can I do within my coursework and then also within my store experience to really build up my experience and build up my case for why I deserve to be a part of the internship program? So I did that work. The next year, I was actually able to get the internship. Uh, I worked in the logistics field for a little while transition to the uh, after school, I went to the planning sector. So I did a lot of forecasting, helping with the product launches. Uh, the first new product I got to launch is Mango Dragon Fruit, which was a nightmare, but also very fun at the same time, learning how to work through that. Uh, and yeah, I was in supply chain for a long time. Pardon me, I live next to a fire station, so that might happen a couple of times, but <laughs> I was in supply chain for a couple of years really recognize that I enjoy strategy, but I wanted to be more on the sales side of it and be higher up in terms of what is the product concept that we're going to launch and how are we going to make that happen in the store. So that spurred me wanting to make the shift to product management and being at Starbucks. One of the real benefits of the company is once you're in the door, it's easy to navigate and get to where you want to go. So I was able to take advantage of the different people I was able to meet and use that to make the transition to product management. Awesome. And I think, you know, bouncing off of what Madison said a little bit as well, and you saying that you switched majors a lot and just talking about experience, it's probably very comforting for college students to hear from, you know, people who are in their careers right now that it is okay to switch majors. It is okay to try different things because uh, there's plenty of time. So thank you guys for your insight. Charles, I'm going to go back to you. What do you look for when you're seeking out new recruits? For like, do you mean like new hires? Like, out yes. Of school? Yeah. Yes. So it really depends on the role. Uh, I think in general, we do a great job at looking up at the makeup of the current team. So if somebody's looking for a, a brand role or product role, looking at individual strengths on the team, looking at where there could be other areas of opportunity outside of just your skills, right? Uh, looking at recent grads or people that are newer into the workforce, it really comes down to passion. In every one of my conversations I have with somebody, I've kind of flipped the model to instead of saying, here's a role, like, tell me why you're good for it. I flip it to say, tell me about your background and what you love doing the most. And then mm -hmm. based on that, I can tell you what we have open or upcoming. And it's more of a mutual kind of beneficial, I guess, Way, ways of working because I think a lot of time, 99% of the companies out there, uh, they get a role, they go through resumes, they call, and that's kind of it. Yeah. So I think really being able to showcase, you know, what you want to do and why you want to do it and what motivates you uh, goes a long way. And I've got to imagine, you know, outside of Red Bull 2, all companies, right? Mm -hmm. So long, long answer, but I'd say that overall. Long answer, but a great answer. So thank you so much. Um. Madison, I'll go back to you. What tips would you give someone who's looking to do what you do now? Oh, gosh. I mean, for me, it all started with social media. I'm 29 and I was just 
in that whole generation of social media becoming a thing. And so really like looking for that underground trend that if you can find a way to make it relevant to business, pitching it to the company you work for, coming up with a business, anything you can do to find things that are relevant in the world that maybe haven't blown up yet. Um, I mean, I remember like trying to convince Surfline to have a MySpace and then a Facebook and then, oh, there's something that's photos only. It's called Instagram. And they're like, what? Like, this is so dumb. How do we market to people? And then finding ways to tie it into business and boom, there you go. You have a whole entire job that you just created for yourself. So really finding things that are relevant and making a nice pitch deck, showing some stats, visuals are key. Um, yeah, and just finding the right person who will listen to you. And I, I have a follow-up question for you and talking about <laughs> social media trends and stuff like that. Of course, the, the big social media elephant in the room right now is TikTok. And mm -hmm. do, you, do you see with you know the trends that are going, someone out there who's really passionate about creating things on TikTok, are they able to get a job through that platform? Yeah, I mean, I would love to have a dedicated TikTok person at Guayaquil because we, I mean, it's so in the moment, it's so trend-based with all the hashtag campaigns. Um, I wouldn't wanna hire an agency to do it because to me that kind of sucks the authenticity out of it for your brand. Right now, our TikTok is ran off of all user generated content and reposts like people just love to be featured. Super fun. And then we occasionally throw up our own content, but it's not really designed for TikTok. So, I mean, yeah, there's like so many companies that would love to hire a dedicated TikTok team from Gen Z who are just living and breathing that. Thank you so much. Here comes all the applications. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Isaiah, can you tell us about what you're most passionate about and how it relates to your work? Hmm. Um, what I'm most passionate about, it's going to sound generic, but it does tie into one of the tenants of Starbucks. So Starbucks, we have three of them. The one that I'm mostly aligned with is helping others succeed. I'm really passionate about that. I love to give back. I feel this responsibility to help the next generation in terms of navigating where they want to go. Part of the reason why I like doing events, I'm grateful that I got invited to do this. Um, but it's helpful at Starbucks to have that company that's aligned with that belief and they take actions to help in areas that I'm interested in. And they really make commitments to help a variety of, you know, issues, topics that I don't need to get into, but it really helps with my work specifically because as a product manager, I am responsible for the assortment that happens within the stores. Uh, so whatever I put into the stores, I'm concerned about how do customers receive it, but also how do our baristas receive it. And being a former barista, I really, really resonate with that because there's some things that we do that make it harder for them to do their job successfully or don't necessarily resonate with all the things that we're communicating to the customer. And it doesn't make it easy for the barista to really try to sell that story and make it uh, make it enticing for the customer. So as I go through my work, part of the lenses that I'm thinking through is how is a barista going to receive this and how is a customer going to receive this? Am I doing something that's going to be to the benefit of both, make them both happy, make them both proud that they're buying Starbucks or working at Starbucks. So helping others and being at a company that is focused on that as well is really, really what keeps me around. Well, I just want to, another follow-up for you. I'm sorry, but on the, on the fact of, you know, helping others and, you know, really, really thinking about others. You and I were, t were talking a few days ago, and this is just that I just want everyone to get a little more insight onto who you are, but you started up a scholarship program. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, two years ago, I was motivated by my grandmother. She was like my, my rock. She's the reason I was able to get through college and really helped me out. And she's always been a very giving person. So I wanted to, you know, follow in her footsteps and find a way that I can give back. So I went back to my old high school, started up a scholarship, and for over the past two years, we've been able to help a couple of kids get a head start in terms of getting their college education. And that has been super fulfilling. I love that work. I love that feeling of just, you know, again, assisting others. And what's great, tying it back to Starbucks once again, they actually have helped me with the scholarship. Uh, one of the benefits mm -hmm. of working at Starbucks is if you donate to a charity, they will match it up to an extent. So they've helped me uh, increase how much I'm able to give. Uh, so I guess advice is as you're looking through places to work, really figure out 
you know, what's your passion? Like Charles has mentioned, like Madison has mentioned, what's your passion? Does that company align with it? Uh, and make your decision off of that, or at least let that be a factor in your decision. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. that that's just really incredible and a, a great story. Um, now I'm going to open this one up to everyone. Uh, I think everyone can give a little insight into this, but I think this is something I worry about a lot as heading out into the workforce and stuff like that. And something I think that we all try and figure out every single day. So tips and tricks, uh, we'd love to have them, but how do you guys try and maintain a work life balance and whoever wants to go can just run with it. So much caffeine. <laughs> Luckily, we're in the right place for it, you know. <laughs> Reducing your caffeine intake so you sleep at night in our worlds. Um, I think just getting outside for me is so important and like making it a date on my calendar and blocking it off. So if somebody tries to set up a meeting at 7 a.m., it's like, no, sorry, that's when I'm running or surfing and makes me a better person to show up at work during the day. Yeah. Similar, just making sure that you prioritize having time for yourself, even walk around the block, running, whatever it may be. I know everybody's got their own kind of niche. I'm personally very organized, though, to where I make sure every day is planned to a T from calls to meetings to everything. So I know, you know, where the breaks are and where it's not. But, you know, everybody, especially during COVID, you got to take care of yourself. So it's everybody finds different therapeutic, you know, things to do and you got to just make sure you do that weekends, capitalize on the weekends, nights, you know, dinners, whatever else, but you make the time for it. Yeah, I'm very similar to Charles in that sense of like, I'm looking at my list right now. Every day I make a list uh, of things work related and non work related that I want to get done. For whatever reason, like being able to cross something off is just like that winning feeling. So I love being able to do that as well. But yeah, just, uh, prioritizing both i know it's been harder for me in COVID and being from home working from home like i don't leave the office at the office it's home with me so i, I had to had to navigate that in terms of making myself close the laptop every once in a while but uh yeah listing it out planning it out it has, has been helpful in terms of balancing it out yeah I, I can't agree more ever since i started college my calendar and notes app have been my best friends so i completely get it and i think it really comes down to um, you know, in the, the basic sense is it is just about priorities and stuff. So I appreciate that. Okay, Charles, we're going to go back to you. We live in the digital world now, and especially, you know, in terms of digital resumes and portfolios, what exactly do you look for? We're sure you spend plenty of time on LinkedIn, but what are the things that you, that like stand out to you and that you're always looking for when you go through those? Yeah, I mean, I, I look at a lot more than just skills. I think there's the, uh, I guess, a motto that comes across Google now, but looking at resumes from the bottom up. So meaning really taking into account what people like to do, what their passions are versus just jumping right into education or what their skills are. It goes so much further than that. Uh, I think the other crazy statistic is like an average recruiter in the market, I think spends three to five seconds on a resume. Uh, which is pretty crazy. So you got to do, again, whatever it takes to make sure that it does stand out, that you are highlighting everything you've done. But it, it just stresses the importance of being able to build your network, reach out to the individuals. Like when I was coming out of school, any company I wanted to work for, I found five to 10 people from managers to VPs. And I did whatever I could to find their emails, LinkedIn, et cetera. And I just sent him a message asking about an informational interview saying, Hey, love what you've done with your career. Would love to hear how you've gotten to this point. This call has nothing to do with me getting a role there, but would love to just, you know, hear your story. And the amount of people that will actually take the time to do that versus an email saying, Hey, I applied to this role. Like, let me know. It makes a massive difference because I, the amount of messages and things that come through too are quite overwhelming sometimes. Uh, so when you start to personalize it, it, it does make a big difference. But I mean, in regards to the resume, it's just highlighting your experience. You don't want to leave anything out. You've gotten promoted, you know, make sure to make those indications, but really include any of those like extra activities you've done or associations you've been a part of or community service. Like those types of things really stand out to me personally. 
because uh, I do think there is so much more than just, you know, sitting at a desk all day. It is a true work-life balance, right? What do you like to do for fun and all that? Absolutely. And I, I, another question I have for you on that front, and just, just because I'm curious about like, you know, the hiring process and stuff, but literally just the other day I was in my international marketing class and one of the Red Bull ambassadors came in and there was Red Bulls hidden under all of our seats and stuff like that. So I see there's a real, you know, real push to get involved with Generation Z, especially on the student level. And I was just wondering, have, have you ever in, in your career so far, hired someone who was an ambassador at a college university? Yeah, so over the last year, I was actually, uh, it fell under my team, somebody on my team oversaw all of the hiring for that. So it technically rolled up under my team and then recently got uh, moved over to another team, but very familiar with that entire hiring process, the roles and responsibilities. Uh, yes, you know that program back in my hand. <laughs> very, very exciting though. The amount of you know individuals we have out at different universities, uh, the responsibilities that they have and what it really is able to help them do. A lot of those individuals end up coming through up the organization, you know, building their network. So it's, it's a really special experience. And I think if you ever get the opportunity to be a, you know, collegiate rep or ambassador, it, it, it's a great experience and in intro into the workforce. Thank you so much, Charles. All right, Madison, I have another question for you. So when if just getting out of college or just, you know, starting to really break into the real world, what are some opportunities that you think people, people should utilize, um, especially right out of the gate? When looking for a job? When looking for a job, trying to find experience, trying yeah. to find their niche. I mean, of course, you just want to get a job and start paying off your student loans and have some money to travel and be out of school. But I mean, you might need to just get kind of a temporary job that you're not that stoked on while you find your passions and can really take your time, like Charles said, to find the job that's for you. And it's such a tough competition out there, especially coming out of COVID. But at the same time, like I encourage people just to be patient and really find the right fit for them. And even if that means taking a temporary job for a little bit to pay the bills and hone in on your passions and the opportunities that are out there. Um, overall, though, just really hustling, like keeping your resume super up to date, creating some something creative to go along with it, like Charles said too, like not just another basic cover letter and the resume that's blanketed to everybody and everything that you're applying to. Um, you know, just really putting your special spin on it, maybe make a video about yourself. We used to have to do that at Guayaquil and it really made you think, it made you study up on the company and it, it made you go to the effort to really like think if that's the best company and role for you. Um, so yeah, just have fun with it and find what you're passionate about, but also don't be so uh, above that you can't, you know, settle for a lower level job and pay the bills for a little bit. I love that. That's so cool that they had to make videos. I think I've never heard of that before. So I think Mine that's... is so embarrassing. I told them to pronounce the brand name and everything, but who uh, doesn't? Well, if it wasn't for you, and I think I even may have messed it up already, but just so everyone knows, Madison sent me a video on how, how to pronounce <laughs> the brand. So um, yeah. video assets are very cool. So I think that's pretty rad. All yeah. right, Isaiah. Can you tell us a little bit about what your team dynamic looks like? And maybe, you know, tell us a little bit about what it's like in person, but also how that's had to adapt during COVID. Yeah. Uh, so at Starbucks and I've been on, since I've been at the headquarters, I've been on five teams. Uh, one thing that's very similar across the board is there's a, there's a hierarchy structure in that, like you'll be an individual contributor, you'll be a manager, a director, so on and so forth. But the team dynamic is not like we follow that structure from a communication standpoint. I have you no know, the autonomy to go and speak with the director, speak with the VP, share my ideas. I'm encouraged to speak up. It's more of a, a downside if you choose not to. They'll look at you a little funny if you decide to be the quiet one in the room. Like they're they're very open to your ideas and you're like I said, you're encouraged to share your perspective and just add on to the conversation. Sometimes it may feel like we're all saying the same thing, but every once in a while you also get that like, 
hmm, that's a different perspective or that's something that we should have been taking into consideration, right? So that's one huge thing. There's very much a open door policy at Starbucks that exists. It existed pre-pandemic. It also is kind of easier now because we have teams and you see somebody with the green available stamp on them and you know you can go and talk to them too. So that is a, a big plus about being on the team. For sure that's that's pretty consistent at least across the experience that i've had at starbucks that's pretty awesome and and that made me think of just like i don't know we're always learning things every day and stuff and can you can you share maybe something that a characteristic or a skill that you've learned and really encompassed that you didn't necessarily have before starbucks but working within that company and working with others you've you've learned more yeah, uh, I had a bad habit of saying no um, <laughs> when people would ask me something, and I didn't necessarily immediately see the immediately see the feasibility to it. I would say no, um, and what I learned coming into the the main office was that it's it's not bad to say no. Like it's it's good to recognize what is going to be difficult or what's not necessarily feasible, but the more constructive way I've found to go about answering those type of questions or responding to those types of questions is saying, yes, but like really working through that uh, question with whoever's asking it, trying to really understand what's underneath this. Is there something that is achievable that we can go and answer? Is this something that even though it seems daunting, regardless of that fact, we should go and try to find a response to anyway. So one like just soft skill that I didn't really recognize before I got to Starbucks, but learned quickly when I got to the office was like, if you say no, you may shut yourself off to one, just learnings, but also opportunities. But if you say yes, but you can work through it and you can build those relationships and really, really better understand the people that you're working with. That was a great, great answer. Thank you so much. All right, Charles, another question for you. Um, Do you have any advice on how people can still get their self out there, even like, during times of COVID or, you know, other, other sort of worldly events like that. What are, what are some advice to people that you can, you can give them the, the still, still get their name out there, their message, their personal brand, even when the world's shutting down? Yeah, no, I think uh, I'd answer it in kind of two ways. I think the first is with everything that's happened. uh, I think it is a great opportunity to continue to educate yourself last year, like I went, I wanted to learn more, I got a certification in something. And so I think it's a great opportunity to, you know, take courses or classes and things you're passionate about. If you want to get into digital or social media, maybe take, you know, SEO certification. I mean, there's a wide variety of things that you can show, like, even during these times, you're continuing to, you know, better yourself, better your background. And then uh, I continue to say it over and over, but, you know, find individually, it could be any of us on this panel or anybody at the company you want to work for and just do the proactive reach outs. Uh, I do my best to respond to every single person that, you know, reaches out. I can't always have, you know, long conversations, but I can at least, you know, have like a quick discussion, you know, maybe a couple of weeks or a month out, but uh, I, I at least will make the time for the individuals that do personalize things and that do actually take the time and I can tell that they're interested versus it's just another kind of like copy paste or situation. So, I mean, continue to grow the network, continue to, you know, better educate yourself. And I think it was Madison that was saying it earlier too, like find the company or companies that you want to work for. Don't, in my opinion, I don't think you should ever chase title. The money will come, but I mean, I've had multiple friends and I know a lot of people that have chased title and money and they're just not as happy as the people that followed the companies where their values aligned, where, you know, everything else fell in place. So I I think that's, you know, very, very important. As do I, thank you so much, Charles. Okay, Madison, another question for you. What is your, your favorite part of the job and just the thing that when that alarm goes off that you makes you get up and like, be like, "I, I can't wait to go to work today. I really love the aspect of community and Guayaki has a really strong community and it goes with, you know, like Charles just touched on too, being passionate about the company that you're working for, having your values aligned. So for me in digital media, 
I don't feel like I'm marketing. I don't feel like it's a mask for some, you know, marketing initiative that we have. We lead with honesty and transparency. And I'm just like proud to share our products, our messages, our values, our vision and mission. Um, it's nothing that I have to wake up every day and put the plastic smile on. I'm just overall proud and stoked to be sharing what we do at Guayaquil Yerba Mate. Thank you so much. Isaiah, another question for you. Can you tell us just a little bit about what the culture is? Similar question to Madison, but just like what the culture is at Starbucks and how they present themselves to their employees. Culture is at Starbucks, how we present ourselves. Um, like I mentioned earlier, helping others succeed, big, big piece of it. We are very much a community as well in terms of just wanting to interact with one another. Uh, open door policy, like I mentioned earlier. I actually <laughs> have a funny story. So my first my first week as an intern, I was lost in our building and I was walking up the stairs trying to find my way back to my desk. And I see this guy at the top of the stairs and his face looks super familiar, but I couldn't think of his name. And he sees me staring at him, walks towards me, sees that I'm lost and is like, can I help you? And then I finally, it finally dawns on me who he is. And I was like, are you Howard Schultz? And he's the founder of Starbucks. And he laughs at me and I'm embarrassed. I'm thinking, oh, I just messed this up. Let me just get out of here as quick as possible. And I tried that, but he grabbed me by the shoulders, just like turned me around. It's like, can I help you? Can I, can I, can I help you figure out where you're going? Who are you? I haven't seen you around here before. So like, this is, this dude's worth billions of dollars. He's the founder of Starbucks. He's got all types of things that he could be doing, but he helped an intern find his way back to his desk during his first week. And like that really solidified to me that like, we really mean what we say, when we care about helping people. Like this guy has, like I said, all the things that he could be doing, but he took the time to help me out. Uh, and it was just like a really reassuring feeling that that community uh, that we try to put forth in our stores and through with our employees, like he really lived that out in that example. And there's like a ton of stories that I could share about just people being there for me uh, in many different ways and how that culture is really just trying to support one another throughout whatever's going on. That's a, that's a crazy, awesome. That's, that's a really cool story. Thank you for sharing. Um, last few questions here um, before we open it up to LinkedIn and have some audience interaction and stuff, but just a few more questions for the group and feel free to hop on this whenever uh, you feel like, but we've talked about a lot of things like, you know, presenting yourself on social media, still reaching out during times of COVID, et cetera. Um, are there any just other tips of that? What, what can students do as college students to really begin to even start their careers? Um, do, you have, do you guys have any advice for that? Yeah, I mean, overall, I think it's, you know, again, really honing in, taking the time while you can to identify where you want to work. I think, you know, especially coming out of school, uh, I know not everybody can, but being open to relocation does help a lot. And if it's for the right opportunity doing that, I will say social media, it's got pros and cons. I think the pros is, you know, we've we found talent off of Pinterest and Instagram and you know, all of these other areas of avenues because you can see, you know, people's talent. Uh, I think sometimes it gets lost that pictures, video, things that you do put out uh, sometimes stay out on the web. Um, not in a negative way by any means, but just in terms of different types of content and different things you're doing, uh, it, it does go both ways. So just as kind of like a, a friendly reminder, I think you can really use social media for good. And I really respect the people that do. And those are the people that really do stand out. Um, but as we all know, I mean, on TikTok, you've got your main page of random things. You've got Instagram, the different formats. So there's so many different avenues to be discovered. Um, and you, you never know who's, you know, getting a drink at Starbucks with you or who's sitting next to you in the cafeteria. I mean, people from all sorts of companies. So just treating people with respect as well, I think goes a very, very long way. I would, I would consider two things. One is 
I think the sustaining barrier that you may face is like the experience question of finding that. Um, so like Madison mentioned earlier, like even if it's not the dream job right away, gaining experience is still a benefit uh, just to be able to tell the stories of it. And I would say as you do that, whether it be through a formal job, whether it be through clubs on campus or volunteer organizations that you're part of, learn to sell yourself, learn to take whatever the tidbits are that are applicable to whatever you're applying to and really be able to emphasize how what you're doing is going to make you successful in what you want to be doing. Um, and the second piece is once you get where you want to be, figure out what your buzz, what your niche is going to be. Like, what is it that if I need something done, what am I going to go to Charles or Madison for? Like for me at Starbucks, I didn't know much, but I knew Excel. So if there was a question that I could solve through Excel, I was signing up to say, I was saying yes, as much as possible, just to like build that reputation of, Hey, he's useful at least in this way. So let's keep him around. Um, I would say that could be, that could be social media. That could be presentations at Starbucks, uh, PowerPoints. There's like the main mode of communication, same with emails. So like, if you have a visual presence in your PowerPoints and you can do something that others can't do, like find that and let that be, uh, part of your reputation initially so that you can, you can really make that name for yourself wherever you're at. I think on a more personal level, even outside of the workforce is just character building and showing up and being a good person, always abiding by the golden rule. You know, how do you show up for your friends and family and how do you show up at work? It all plays into each other, especially when you work for a company that's so tightly knit. And nowadays, a lot of us are separated with so many Zoom meetings and working from home. How can you find ways to like always show up to be your best self, you know, be a good teammate, have that camaraderie, even when you're having a really bad day? Um, how do you work through that? What are your tools? So just like always finding like, who you are in your heart and like what you can improve on being humble and building character at all times. And for me, a lot of that is getting out of your usual community. Like I said, um, you know, signing up for classes or networking events or going to a concert that you might not even like the music for just to get tastes of other walks of life and continue to like build upon your world culturally career-wise, um, meet more friends, just always looking for opportunities to get out of your bubble, push your comfort zone, and just build experience. To me, that like experience is the best education in and outside of the workplace. So just like get out there, or if you can't because of COVID, finding things to do online or, you know, socially distance that you can still do to keep growing and learning and expanding who you are. Incredible. Thank you guys so much for that answer. I, I, I personally have one more question and then we'll open it up to uh, the rest of the chat. But can you guys just share a time when within your careers, you were just down, it was real bad. And, you know, as when you look at it, at it now, the lessons that the, what is the lesson that you learned from that experience that made you say like, okay, even though that was rough, like, I'm happy that happened. I have one that just like comes to mind as a traumatized teenager. I used to have to, we had like surf VHSs and DVDs and posters at Surfline. And I would have to push the mail cart down Main Street in Huntington Beach, which is like where everybody goes. And it was so humiliating to me at first to have to like push the mail cart and all my friends would see me and make funny remarks. And then I was like, you know what? I have a job. I have a job at a really cool company and I get to come here after work. I get to surf. I mean, after school, I get to surf. I get to be around like-minded people and meet like some really cool pro surfers and forecast gurus. Who cares if I'm doing the mail? Screw all of you. And so I think just like finding, like owning what you do is so important and, you know, just never being too big for something at work. Like, you got to stoop down and like be the janitor on some days and be like, you know, fully level in the playing field. So just always show up to work and, you know, check your humble card. <laughs> I go next. Uh, I'll always remember this and I've got to find this person at one point, but coming out of college at the time, it wasn't 
even so much LinkedIn really. It was like you would apply on Indeed and Monster Career Builder. And I remember just clicking apply to a ton of stuff. I thought at the time I wanted to get into marketing and I don't even think I realized I had applied to this role, but it was like a VP of marketing or something out in Tucson, uh, bear down, sorry, ASU, but, uh, they responded. They took the time to respond. And it was just like, why do you think you're qualified for this? But they said it in a really nice way. And I remember at that point, it kind of triggered something for me to actually hone in on what I wanted to do versus what most people tell you to do is just get a job out of college get something right, get started. And really, I mean, you do have the luxury to pick. I mean, there's a lot of things out there. Um, I'm not saying you have a hundred different roles and you get to choose which one you take. Um, But I mean, I never thought I'd be in recruiting and I love talking to people. And so that was an avenue for me to where I thought I was going to get into social media and marketing and ended up here and love it. So I I don't, I think it really just opened up the door to, to find what I personally made me happy. And then, you know, finding the companies that I valued behind it. Yeah, for me, my first role after graduation was on the Tivana retail stores, which was technically a part of Starbucks, but it was still kind of its own thing. It was a recent acquisition, much smaller than actual Starbucks. And I was initially disappointed, just thinking like, oh, I'm finally, I'm, I'm about to go to the big leagues. I'm about to go work on, you know, pumpkin spice immediately and don't go to do, go do that. And, um, at first, when I when I was told where I was going, I wasn't I wasn't happy, and I thought, oh, this is gonna be so awful because like who cares about the team on a retail stores, and immediately like I was so grateful for that experience because working on the smaller business, I got to do more things, and you know, experiences come up a lot through this conversation. I got so much more experience working on Tivana than I would have had I gone to a, like a, a true Starbucks entry level role. So I'm so I'm so grateful for that. Just being able to have those conversations across different teams, learn a lot of different skill sets um, and really pick up on a lot of the business and really, really, you know, get experiences. Like I said, that I wouldn't have gotten had I gone to a typical Starbucks role. So just be be humble, be happy where you end up and take what you can from the role because there's something to learn. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for answering my questions. We're going to open it up to the chat now. We already have some questions coming in. So this one's for everyone from Little Wolf, a science associate at Perkin Elmer Genomics. Do you have any advice for middle agers going back to school slash changing careers? I mean, I don't think there's ever a time, I mean, maybe way later on, but I know people in their 30s, 40s, et cetera, that are still changing their careers. Uh, I think that's another, you know, something out in the the industry that you need to know what you want to do coming out of college. I mean, it's fine to change your careers. And so I think honing in on what you want to do and if it's education to help better that or if it's, you know, just changing careers in general. At the end of the day, I just reiterate what I was saying earlier, it's the money will come, the titles will come, but none of that happens if you're not motivated day in and day out loving what you do. And if you are, I, you know, I may challenge you on that, but uh, it, you really gotta be passionate about what you do. So there's, I mean, whether you change your role now or go back to school in 10 years, do what makes you happy and, you know, Go for it. Thank you for that answer. Um, Another question from Amy Daniel, a customer service account manager at FILA and a digital media student. It is hard to get a feel for a company's culture during the virtual interview process. Any advice for how to get around this issue? can let one you guys speak first and then I can jump in. <laughs> All right, I'll take I'll take this on first. I think we've brought it up a couple of times. If you make those personal connections through a LinkedIn and through another medium, I think one on one you might get a lot more transparency, especially outside of the interview process than you may once you're in it. Uh Google helps too. You can research what are people saying. You'll find people on both sides of whatever the whatever the question is and really be able to do your own research and figure out, okay, 
if there was something I wanted to ask that person, once I get that one-on-one -on -one conversation, let me ask about this. So yeah, the interview process, at least I've experienced that as well. It's tough to know truly what's going to come of it. Some of it you won't learn until you get there, but if you, if you try to make the connections beforehand, uh, outside of that, maybe, maybe you can get some extra insight ahead of that. Yeah, and I, I think something important to, to note is it's just as important that a company sells themselves to you as you sell yourself to them. And there's been companies, uh, very well-known companies, I probably will not work for going forward based on past interview experiences because companies should want to tell you about what they're involved in from a community side, what their values are. They should be able to tell you that and give you the overview and tell you how the role plays a bigger part into the organization. And so going into these interviews, like do your research, have the questions ready. But I, I think having those conversations are so important. Um, and if a company is just grilling you over and over and over, and it's just really, you know, technical, um, you then have to make the decision, is that somebody that you want to work for because at the end of the day, if they're doing this during an interview, chances are that may actually happen tenfold in a day to day. So I, I do think it's important to come prepared, ask your questions, get an understanding, and then just kind of reiterate and everything uh, as I said as well. Thank you guys. We have a question from Sam Ellingsworth, a marketing communications specialist at U.S. Global Investors. And the question is, would you recommend a college degree over a boot camp course or trade school, especially when changing career paths? I think it has to do more with your experience. So it depends on the trajectory that you're on and the timeline of like how quickly you're looking to change your career. Um, but definitely there's so many great online courses and in-person courses or workshops that you can take that, you know, might be more applicable to the career that you're after rather than a college course that might be broader, like business management. Well, do you have time to specialize in that and go to school for two years? It really depends. And how much, you know, it might be a financial thing too. How much time can you take off work in between to go back to school or can you take night classes really just weighing out the the time and the costs, um, pros and cons to see what you have to work with and making it accessible to you. So you're not stressing yourself out and then getting burnt out on this career shift that you're looking forward to taking. Yeah, I don't think it's a one size fits all approach to what Madison said. Um, education, like an MBA may be the typical pre step before certain career fields, but like my transition from supply chain to product management didn't require me to do anything extra. I was fortunate enough to build a network with people in the org that I wanted to be in and leverage that in order to make the transition. So sometimes yes, sometimes no, I guess. So I have a question for Charles. Can you please expand upon the experience you have with people, uh, people titles slash salary hunting? What are your thoughts on talents, skill, dedication, et cetera, versus experience in years? Yeah, I think it depends. I, a lot of these questions are very situational, um, but on, on this, it, it really does depend because even similar to my example, if you're coming out of college trying to get a senior director role at a you know top company, it, that could be a little bit different. But depending on the role you're looking for, if you are able to find what you're passionate about and be able to tell the story on how those activities or experiences can relate, that will stand out to a lot of companies. Um, in terms of the title and salary hunting, I, I think I'm a little bit different. I've never been somebody that's chased title. I've never been somebody that's chased money really focus in and at the end of the day job descriptions don't even do jobs full justice in terms of what they're doing and that's why i think it's so important to do the research on the companies understand you know what those values are and really what you want to do and even if you don't know what you want to do in five years ten years there's nothing wrong with that um but day to day understanding okay well do you want to be in excel 
24 seven. If not, then maybe you need to be in a different creative role. Um, so really assessing it personally uh, and then going from there. But it, it is so much more through my lens anyways than just, can you code in this language? Can you code in that language? Like, I think companies want more and more individuals that can collaborate with each other, that can work cross-functionally, that can help elevate other people's success. And so long-winded answer, but yes, there's, there's a lot to it. It's very situational. Thank you for your answer, Charles. And we are going to uh, end with our last question here. Um, this is also from Amy. She says, I am currently in account management seeking a more creative role to use my digital media and web technology degree. Do you have any pointers for how I can approach pitching myself for roles more in line with digital media without rubbing my current management the wrong way? Is, is this from an internal perspective or external? Do we know? I'm going to assume internal. Okay. Madison, you beat me to uh, taking it off mute. If you want to answer, I'll I go after. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of wondering internally or externally um, as well. But I would say, you know, networking with your own team, you know, or I guess cross departmentally and then really proving yourself. So maybe, you know, without being critical, but bringing some fresh ideas that they might want to tap into and like proposing those, hey, I noticed this about your digital media from an accounting perspective or from an outside perspective. I know for me, I'm always looking for fresh perspective because I live and breathe our marketing every day. So maybe approach it as you have some interesting outside things to share with them and, um, you know, want to take them to lunch or to dinner and really catch up or if it's over Zoom, having just kind of more of like a networking meetup with them than like a formal meeting and just sharing some ideas and also asking for their friendly criticisms from what they see um, from their digital media side about accounting. So it's more of like a, a cross networking collaboration. And then you can kind of see how the conversation goes from there if there are any opportunities. Completely ditto everything uh, Matt said. I, I think additionally, um, having those conversations with your manager, uh, it you should be able to, I can't speak for everybody, but you should feel comfortable having those conversations with the manager. I think a manager is always looking out for you know their direct reports, their teams, and wanting to better them. And so anybody that you know was looking to expand their skill sets have those open conversations saying, you know, if I am doing all of my responsibilities, is there a way I could take on a project or maybe help with something on the side? And then that way it can become a more of a segue versus just like an out of the blue, like, Hey, I'm applying, I'm looking for something else. So I, I think, you know, there is multiple ways to do it, but having that relationship, like Madison was saying, to get a better understanding, uh, bringing ideas to the table, um, you know, speaking up, all of it. Well, thank you guys so much. That is going to conclude um, the Q&A portion of our panel today. I just want to say thank you to these guys and, of course, uh, to all of you for tuning on. Thank you, Charles, Madison, and Isaiah. It's been a real good hour, and I've just really appreciated the insight that you shared with us, and I'm sure everyone else has as well. So right now I'm going to quickly show uh, a demo I pre-recorded on Adobe Portfolio um, and just give you guys sort of an intro into what Adobe Portfolio is and how you can use it for your career aspirations. And remember to check out our Discord server, post it, post your portfolio, and uh, we'll be selecting some, uh, some of you guys to have a one-on-one -on -one with our panelists and possibly even get Adobe Cloud uh, for one year free. So a lot of cool stuff coming up. Thank you guys again for joining us and yeah. Thanks everyone. Thank you guys. Right Bye. Hey guys, it's DJ from the past here and I'm very excited to talk to you guys a little bit about Adobe portfolio. Now this isn't going to be like a super in-depth comprehensive look at portfolio, but just hopefully lower those barriers of entries that it takes for you guys to feel like you need to be able to build a website and you guys can get your hands dirty just a bit. So here are the three main takeaways. It's a professional and academic asset. It's really easy to use. 
And last but not least, you get a website that you actually own. So let's hop right into it. First and foremost, all you need to get access to these tools are an Adobe Creative Cloud account. Whether you're paying for it yourself, it's being paid for by school or work, or even if you're just using the free trial, that's all you need and you're good to go. So let's, let me show you. I've been working on this the past week. This is my website and I've had a lot of fun. I'm excited to show it to you guys. So I'm a videographer and for the longest time I needed a place to display my work. Uh, screen recording my videos on my phone and sending them to clients just wasn't cutting it because it's just not professional. And alongside resumes, it's really nice to have a website where you can host your portfolio and have all your work in a nice and professional way. So let's go down here and let's click a commercial project and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So as you can see, I have my long list here of videos. And the nice part is, is Adobe has no restrictions on the amount of space your website can take up. The server, all that, Adobe handles it. And so literally, I can just have videos on top of videos on top of videos and never have to worry about it. And I'll probably just keep posting more and more and more because that's so nice to have everything right in its just a single spot. And even if you're not a videographer, a designer, a photographer, in the technological world we live in today, it's just important to have a website. In fact, I'm a communications major and I need a website to graduate. It's one of the requirements. So even just like an about page like this is just really nice and sleek and will just give you an upper hand, you know, when you're in the hiring process going against other candidates. So let's actually talk about designing the website itself. The nice part is, is it's all super streamlined thanks to things like Adobe Creative Cloud Libraries. At the top of the website here, this logo I made, I made an Illustrator and I was able to add it to my, my navigation bar with a click of a button. If you go over here to the left to integrations, you can see you can import a lot of your projects straight from Behance, Adobe Lightroom and get pictures from Adobe Stock. It's really easy. And especially with the fact that you're not using HTML and CSS Look at this, for example, if you go over here to navigations, you click on social icons, you just take your social media URL, post it in these boxes, hit this little button, and over here in the top right corner is all of your social media icons. I, that, that, that right there would take a lot to code if you're using just HTML or CSS. And the only reason why I would know is I took a one website design class in college, and my final project was a website that looked nothing like this. So I, I can't even begin to describe the power that this program gives you. And it's all really simple and easy to use. We can also change things such as a picture. Let's do it right here. We'll go to masthead, masthead background, let's hit replace. And let's do this one. See how that looks. Just take a second to load and then it's automatically just popped right into your website. Just like that, voila, easy peasy. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is ownership of a website because one of the big benefits is Adobe. This is your website. You get to keep it. And they give you, you can make your own URL. You, mine is djgray.myportfolio.com and you can purchase the domain or connect your other domain or whatever and actually have real ownership of it. But really you, you just with an Adobe Creative Cloud account, you, you get to keep this website forever and you can switch it to other accounts you can make sure that like you, you, if you ever need to like cancel or bring it back that your website transfers over. As long as you have an Adobe Creative Cloud account, you get to keep your website. Well, that's it for me guys. I know this is quick and sweet, but I just appreciate you guys listening and I hope you guys get to take advantage of Adobe Portfolio. Okay, everyone. Well, that is it for today's session. I just want to say one more thank you to you guys for tuning in, of course, to our amazing panelists. And last but not least, Adobe for hosting this panel. Make sure to check out more that we have coming up in the future. And also, please make sure to enter our portfolio challenge. Like I said, you can win a one-on-one -on -one with one of the panelists and a one-year free subscription of Adobe Creative Cloud. So thank you guys again. My name is DJ Gray. I'll see you guys later.